The committee will come to order. Uh, I will start today's hearing uh, by reading the Oversight and Government Reform Committee's mission statement. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have the right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring them genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Today, we are here for a hearing entitled uh, a joint hearing between the Financial Management Workforce, uh, be, between the Financial Service Subcommittee uh, of TARP, uh, I am sorry, the Oversight and Government Reform Committee on TARP Financial Services and Bailouts of Public and Private Programs uh, in a joint hearing with the Financial Management Workforce and Operations uh, Subcommittee. Uh, and uh, this hearing is entitled SEC, Who is Watching Wall Street's Watchdog? Now, when we called this hearing originally, we were concerned about capital formation um, and accountability at the SEC. A uh, number of management practices had come to light at that point um, that, that we thought it would be important to discuss. But a lot has changed just in the last uh, two weeks in terms of disclosures of what is happening at the SEC and larger issues of concern with management. Um, and. Uh, uh, it, that strike at the agency's credibility. And so there will be a lot of questions to that regard at today's hearing. I, I welcome the panel. I thank you for being here. And with, with that, I yield uh, the chairman of the full committee uh, my customary five minutes as subcommittee chair for his opening statement. I thank the chairman and I thank him for his generosity with the opening statement. I, too, had thought this hearing would be about slightly different matters. But in recent days, the Committee has become aware of what could be the greatest challenge to the SEC's credibility since Bernie Madoff managed to dupe so many Americans, steal so much money with his Ponzi scheme, and escape the proper scrutiny of the SEC for so long. As we have learned, in 2009, the former general counsel, Mr. Becker, came to the uh, to the SEC and informed the chairman that he had a potential conflict of interest. We hope to learn exactly how that was expressed, but that, in fact, he had received, with his, along with his siblings, $2 million that came from the liquidation of a Bernie Madoff fund in 2005. That would be serious enough that anyone would normally consider that he should be recused from any activity related to the Madoff after action. Notwithstanding that, Mr. Becker, feeling that this was, as we have understood it, a de minimis amount relative to his estate, in fact, not only continued to be involved, but was instrumental in having the SEC inserted into the process of trying to change how the determination of how much money would, in fact, be considered to be eligible to be retained by those who got their money out before the collapse versus how much would be clawed back for the greater good of all those involved and victimized by the Ponzi scheme. Had Mr. Becker's suggestions been taken, in fact, Mr. Becker's mother's estate of $2 million would have benefited well all those who were there to the end and lost so much would have been victimized. The problem we are going to be probing into in this hearing, in addition to others, is can we trust an SEC where the process allows an individual to inform the chairwoman, to inform the ethics individual who actually re reports to the general counsel, and get effectively a clean bill of health not to disclose and not to recuse and even to be involved in an action that, had it been accepted, as our understanding is, by the trustee, would have led to a distortion of the process in favor of Mr. Becker's family. Now, we take Mr. Becker at his word that, in fact, he intended no wrong. We are willing to take 
factually than 25 minutes. The ethics uh, individual at uh, SEC made a determination there was no problem and stuck by it. We are willing to hear the chairwoman out here today. What we are not willing to do as a committee that deals in waste, fraud, and abuse, and as a committee of Congress, all of us being concerned a great deal about the confidence in what the SEC represents in its oversight and its fairness and its competence, we are not willing to accept that this can ever happen again. So, Mr. Chairman, I am not going to presume any facts not yet in evidence. So far, we only have a limited amount of reports, a, law, a clawback procedure against Mr. Becker, and Becker, Mr. Becker's own interview here with some of our investigators. Today we have an opportunity to listen to the Chairwoman, to realize that, in fact, she inherited an organization that had known flaws, that the, her, her independent agency has, in fact, been the subject of the, the President's attention and her attention and that we have not yet high confidence, but high hope that, in fact, the SEC will live up to its mandate, not just of having a complex web of rules that tell public companies that if their own child works for a company, they can't really be outside or independent uh, officers or uh, directors of the company, or, for example, what a conflict is to the people who oversee, who can be on the compensation committee, who can't. It is a complex business. But it relies on a belief that, there, that the rules are necessary, they are implemented in a sensible way, uniformly, and that they are for a purpose. I believe, as we look further into the Becker matter, we are going to find the SEC failed to have the highest level of care so that public confidence could be maintained. I can find no way out of this. I hope today we at least understand how this mistake came to happen. Mr. Chairman, once again, for, thank you for holding this important uh, hearing, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for your opening statement. With that, I uh, recognize the distinguished member from Illinois, the subcommittee chair of the TARP Financial Services and Bailout Subcommittee, Mr. Quigley, for five minutes. Sorry, I just promoted you to chairman. I'm sorry. Ranking member, Mr. Quigley. Soon, want, soon you, to be chairman. <laughs> if, if you want to scoot over, I'm all good with that. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I, th I assume we will be joined by Chairman Platts as well. I would like to thank our witnesses for their time today and their contributions. Uh, as we all know, in December of 2008, uh, Bernard Madoff was arrested for running the largest Ponzi scheme in American history. Losses from Madoff's fraud have been estimated at $18 billion, devastating the savings of many Americans. We all know the SEC missed Madoff despite being tipped off on several occasions. Although no regulatory agency should be expected to be perfect, a failure of this magnitude is clearly unacceptable. How did this happen? Many have blamed the SEC's outdated technology, which is woefully behind what the financial firms are using. Many have blamed the SEC's silo problem, which prevents coordination among the SEC's many offices. Another culprit that has been cited is the SEC's workforce, which some argue includes too many lawyers and not enough industry veterans. <coughs> And we have all heard about the SEC employees viewing pornography, pornography instead of doing their jobs. These are reasonable concerns and all merit oversight from these two subcommittees. We have also heard about a potential conflict of interest from David Becker, formerly senior counsel at the SEC. It is my understanding that SEC IG David Kotz is investigating this matter. I look forward to his report. Just a few years removed from Madoff and the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, we need the SEC to do its job and do it well. The SEC is Wall Street's policeman. It was established by the 1934 Security Exchange Act to prevent fraud and abuse in the securities market. Creating the SEC was essential to restoring investor trust in our country's economic system. If our economic system is going to work, says Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz, then we need to, then we have to make sure that what people gain when they cheat is offset by a system of penalties. Each year, the SEC brings hundreds of enforcement cases against firms that have sold fraudulent financial products. In 2010, for example, the SEC brought 681 enforcement cases against 1,800 defendants. Just as all of us feel more comfortable in our neighborhoods when they are well policed, investors feel more comfortable buying financial products when the SEC is doing its job in prosecuting white-collar crime. 
and the SEC is more important today than ever before. Trust in our financial system is at its lowest ebb, and this lack of trust is impeding our economic recovery. The financial regulatory reform law passed here was a step in the right direction, but it alone is insufficient. Laws have to be enforced, and the SEC needs to be a strong enforcer. Unfortunately, the House passed budget would reduce SEC funding from its current $1.1 billion. For comparison's sake, Citibank spent $1.6 billion on marketing alone in 2010. How is the SEC expected to police Wall Street when its entire budget is less than the marketing budget of one Wall Street bank? In, in a May 2010 report, the minority staff of the Oversight Committee found that the Commission's security disclosure procedures are technologically backward. Yet under the House pass cuts, the SEC won't be able to continue any improvement of its IT systems. And if the SEC's budget is reduced to 2008 levels, as some have proposed, the SEC would have to lay off 600 workers. My point is this. Just a few years after the Madoff and the worst financial crisis in recent history, should we really be talking about taking 600 cops off of Wall Street? Let us strengthen the SEC, not weaken it. And let us also ensure that the SEC undertakes common sense reform to avoid past mistakes. Put another way, after 9-11, despite our intelligence failures, we didn't cut the intelligence budget. We doubled it. It is my understanding that the SEC has already reorganized, brought in a COO, and designed a, a new TIPS referral system. These are all commendable steps. In the end, our country will be safer from another financial crisis if the SEC is well organized and well funded. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses who I hope will provide some constructive ideas on how to improve the SEC's oversight of financial markets. Thank you, and I yield back. I thank the Ranking Member. And uh, uh, with agreement, prior agreement on our side, uh, Dr. Gosar from Arizona will have five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me preface my comments with the following. I am not a financial analyst. I am not an accountant. I am not a lawyer. But I do have skin in the game, as do most Americans. Most Americans are compelled to invest in the markets through their employer-sponsored retirement plans, whether they are 401K plans or public or union pension plans. The money largely goes to Wall Street. The public needs assurances that those who handle our money and our retirement futures are playing by the rules and are being fair and are honoring their fiduciary responsibility and obligations. The public assurances come from the Securities Exchange Commission. The SEC is supposed to be guarding the hen house. This hearing raises troubling questions. Who is watching the hen house, the fox or the guard? Mr. Chairman, recent news reports have focused on David Becker's conflict of interest. But this hearing is not about a single incident. This problem is actually far deeper and goes to the very heart of management practices at the SEC. Every organization needs a set of mechanisms to prevent or detect fraud, waste, or mismanagement. These are commonly known as internal controls. It would appear that internal controls at the SEC are not functioning properly. One, the Government Accounting Office tells us that the SEC is unable to reliably track its finances because it cannot control its own financial reporting. Two. The SEC's Inspector General tells us that 30 employees, including an insist assistant regional director, viewed sexually explicit materials at work, and only one was actually fired. Was anyone else ever disciplined? Three. Now the news media tells us that the SEC's general counsel was allowed to advise the commissioners on, Mad on the Madoff case when he had a personal financial interest. All these matters represent a breakdown in oversight and management, a failure of internal controls. The sad irony is, is that the SEC is the Federal agency in charge of making sure publicly traded companies have effective internal controls and public governance structures. In fact, Mr. Chairman, if these events happened at a publicly traded company, the SEC would be investing in, investigating itself. And what would be the penalties? Federal agencies are subject to the Federal Manager's Financial Integrity Act, which dictates that they provide annual assurances to Congress that their internal controls are adequate. 
This law has been in effect since 1982 and governs not just financial management, but program management as well. The Federal Manager's Financial Integrity Act is within this committee's jurisdiction. Therefore, this hearing is about, has an important legislative and oversight purpose, the Commission's compliance with the law and others. Mr. Chairman, the anecdotal examples of internal breakdown are symptoms of a much larger systemic breakdown. Since there is no SEC to investigate, investigate the SEC, today I challenge my colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. And uh, I now recognize the Ranking Member of the Subcommittee of, on Government Organization Efficiency and Financial Management, Mr. Towns, former Chairman of the committee, full committee, uh, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing today. Uh, the SEC is at an important crossroad. It is successfully emerging from a troublesome period leading up to collapse of the country's financial system. And it is poised to take the lead in reforming Wall Street and preventing another financial meltdown through its enforcement of the Dodd-Frank Act. This hearing will examine financial management, the workforce, and internal operations at the SEC. It is encouraging to see all the new initiatives Chairman Shapiro has put in place in the last two years. The SEC hired its first chief operating officer to oversee the accounting functions and financial reporting and internal controls, and we salute you for that, uh, Madam Chair. The SEC has also hired a new chief information officer to oversee its information technology functions. The, the chairperson has restructured the entire enforcement division, recruited experts, and is putting a new governance structure in place. This is commendable as well. As with any organization, lapses can, do, and will occur. I understand the SEC has taken disciplinary actions against those who have been accused of misconduct at the Commission, and that greater accountability has been integrated into the disciplinary process. The SEC is responsible for safeguarding the confidence of America, American investors in the financial markets, and I hope our hearing today will help our financial watchdogs fulfill its mission. I now yield the balance of my time to the ranking member of the full committee. I want, to thank the, from Maryland. I want to thank the gentleman for yielding. This committee is responsible for ensuring that our government operates effectively and efficiently. That means holding public officials to the highest standards, demanding excellence at every turn, and eliminating even the appearance of impropriety. Today, the committee intends to examine allegations against David Becker, the former general counsel of the SEC. I do not know Mr. Becker. I have never met him, never talked to him, and the minority uh, was excluded from Mr. Becker's interview when the chairman of ICE's staff interviewed him. But I do want to make sure that everyone who comes before this committee is treated fairly, including Mr. Becker, Chairman Shapiro, and others. If I understand the facts correctly, Mr. Becker's parents invested about $500,000 with Bernie Madoff in 2000. Mr. Becker's mother died in 2004, and when her funds were divided among Mr. Becker and his two brothers in 2006, they had increased to about $2 million. When Mr. Becker joined the SEC in 2009, he notified the SEC officials about his inheritance, and when issues arose relating to his inheritance, he sought advice from SEC ethics officials and received clearance to proceed. Some have suggested that Mr. Becker may have benefited financially from the SEC's later decisions, but it appears that the opposite may be true. The basic question the SEC faced was whether to support an asset valuation method used by the trustee representing the Madoff victims called the cash-in, cash-out method, or a different valuation method proposed by several law firms called the last statement method. Under the first, Mr. Becker's inheritance would be subject to litigation to recover or claw back assets on behalf of the Madoff vi victims. Under the second, it appears that it would not. Based on the court filings, the SEC chose to support the first method. This meant the trustee could sue Mr. Becker and his brothers to recover some of his mother's inheritance, which is exactly what happened? Mr. Chairman, you, in, in your briefing memo for today's hearing, uh, you acknowledge that the SEC's decision was, quote, actually detrimental to Mr. Becker's interests. Nevertheless, I have serious questions about 
the conclusions of the SEC's Ethics Office, Chairman uh, Shapiro, that these issues had no effect on Mr. Becker's financial interests. Someone else of questionable character might have tried to take advantage of this situation. I also have questions about whether Mr. Becker's interests uh, should have been disclosed more widely within the SEC, and I hope we can learn more about this process today. I also invite my Republican colleagues to join us uh, in making sure that the SEC has all the resources it needs. Uh, they are cutting, proposed cutting $148 million from their budget. And we do need the, a, a robust uh, SEC. Uh, Chairwoman Shapiro, uh, I read uh, about what you have done and what you have accomplished. You inherited a mess. You inherited an agency that Senator McCain said the former chair should resign. And so we understand that. And so, uh, again, I am looking for a fair hearing and one where we can get to the bottom of all of this. I yield back. I thank the ranking member. And uh, all members may have seven days to submit opening statements for the record. We are going to now recognize the panel. Uh, we have the Honorable Mary Shapiro, the Chairman of the Securities Exchange Commission. Mr. Jeffrey uh, Reisinger uh, is the Director of the SEC's Office of Human Resources. Uh, Mr. Jonathan Jack Katz uh, is the former Secretary of the Securities and Exchange Commission for 20 years. Uh, Mr. Stephen uh, Crimmins is a, is a securities attorney with K&L Gates. He serves as uh, Deputy Chief Litigation Counsel of the SEC's Enforcement Division from 1993 to 2001. And Ms. Helen Chapman is the attorney representing approximately 350 investors in Mr. Bernard L. Madoff's investment securities firm. Uh, it is the policy of the committee that all witnesses be sworn in before they testify. Please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record, you may be seated. The record uh, will reflect that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. And with that, I thank you. And so we will begin at this time uh, with uh, Chairman Shapiro. I, I think you have heard members' opening statements, and we would love to hear your comments, especially about this conflict uh, that has been discussed. Ms. Shapiro. Thank you very much, Chairman McHenry, um, ranking members Quigley and Towns, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to testify today regarding the financial management, workforce management, and internal operations of the Securities and Exchange Commission. As you know, I am joined by Jeff Reisinger, the Director of our Office of Human Resources. When I arrived at the SEC two years ago, the agency was reeling from a variety of economic events and mission failures and in need of across-the-board reform. We needed more experts, better training, improved communication among our divisions and offices, and an effective strategy for handling tips and complaints. And these challenges were exacerbated by inadequate infrastructure, material weaknesses in financial management, and a culture that had failed to keep up with an increasingly complex financial marketplace. And so we immediately and comprehensively set out to change the way the Commission worked. My written testimony details the reforms of the last two years, but I would like to highlight a few. We brought new leadership and senior management to virtually every office and hired the Commission's first chief operating officer. We revitalized and restructured our enforcement and examination operations and revamped our handling of tips and complaints. We broke down internal silos and created a culture of collaboration. We recruited more staff with specialized expertise and real-world experience and expanded our training. And we enhanced safeguards for investors' assets through new rules and the leveraging of public accounting firms. Although we have made significant progress, we continue to seek ways to improve our operations. After all, our core responsibilities, pursuing fraud, reviewing corporate disclosures, overseeing the largest capital markets in the world, and inspecting the activities of thousands of financial intermediaries are essential to restoring investor confidence in the wake of the financial crisis. But our funding has presented challenges. From 2005 to 2007, the SEC experienced three years of frozen or reduced budgets, forcing a 10 percent reduction of the agency's staff. Similarly, the agency's investment in new or enhanced IT systems declined approximately 50 percent between 2005 and 2009. While SEC staffing levels are just now returning to 2005 levels, 
the securities markets have undergone tremendous growth since then. Indeed, during the past decade, trading volume has more than doubled, the number of investment advisors grew by 50 percent, and the funds they manage increased to $38 trillion. And operating under the continuing resolution only exacerbates the imbalance between our resources and the magnitude of our mission. At the same time, the Dodd-Frank Act is significantly expanding the SEC's responsibilities for the derivatives market, hedge fund advisors, and municipal advisors. In addition, we are also charged with enhanced supervision of rating agencies, heightened regulation of asset-backed securities, and the creation of a new whistleblower program. For these reasons, I am concerned that without additional resources, we will not be able to fulfill these responsibilities in the manner which Congress intends and the American people deserve. Finally, I would like to address the issue of former General Counsel David Becker's role in light of his mother's ownership of an account at Madoff that was closed years before the fraud was revealed. Mr. Becker informed me, I believe shortly after he arrived in 2009, that his mother had had an account with Madoff before she died and that it had been closed a number of years before he returned to the agency. It did not strike me that his mother's account closed years ago would prevent, present a, conflict, a financial conflict of interest. Mr. Becker was and is an experienced attorney who had served as general counsel under three chairmen, and I relied on him to present any ethics-related issues to ethics counsel and follow ethics counsel's advice, and I understand that is what he did. When I returned to the agency in 2009, having served there in the late 80s and early 90s, appointed by President Reagan and President Bush, I read many letters from Madoff's victims, people who had lost everything. My entire focus was on how to fix the SEC to ensure that another tragedy like Madoff could never happen again, and how to make sure, within the contours of the Securities Investors Protection Act, that we could get the most money to people who were literally losing their homes. I am proud of how much we have accomplished in the past two years, working tirelessly with an extraordinary staff to improve the operation of the Commission and enhance the public's perception of the integrity of our work and the fairness of our decisions. But while Mr. Becker did solicit and follow advice from the Ethics Council, I realize in light of this incident that, as Chairman, I have to ensure that we go beyond what may be required in any particular situation. On matters like these, I have to be looking around the next corner, looking beyond the horizon, and thinking above and beyond what may be appropriate advice from Ethics Council to make sure nothing occurs that could raise questions about the Commission's mission or processes. To ensure that this matter is fully reviewed, I requested that the SEC Inspector General conduct an independent review and analysis of all of the relevant facts. In addition, under the leadership of our new Ethics Council, we have been performing a top-to-bottom review of our ethics program. In the meantime, I look forward to answering questions about this matter to the best of my recollection. But I can say to this committee with assuredness, we will learn from this experience and we will take all actions necessary to earn the trust that the public places in us. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and uh, I would counsel the committee that uh, the lights before you, uh, at one minute to go, it will turn yellow and red means stop. So uh, with that, if you could uh, keep your comments to five minutes, we would certainly appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Uh, Reisinger. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I am happy to be before the committee today and look forward to taking your questions. I don't have any further statements. Five seconds. That might be a record. <laughs> Thank you and congratulations. Uh, Mr. Katz. Good afternoon, Chairman McHenry, uh, Chairman Platts, Ranking Member Quigley, uh, ranking Member Towns, members of the two subcommittees. It really is an honor to be invited to testify on the operations of the Securities and Exchange Commission today. It is a matter of great interest and importance to me personally, because for most of my career I was an employee of the SEC. For 20 of those years I served as the Commission's secretary, which was one of those unusual positions that afforded me a rare opportunity to participate firsthand in virtually every aspect of the Commission's responsibilities. I retired from the Commission in January of 2006, and in the five intervening years I have really been fortunate. Uh, I have served as a technical advisor to a variety of securities commissions and governments in emerging market countries, and I have also had the opportunity to speak and write about financial regulation in the U.S. In 2008, the Center for Capital Market Competitiveness at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce invited me to conduct a study and write a report on how to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the SEC. 
I wrote this study based upon interviews with more than 50 current and former SE State staff persons and commissioners who agreed to be interviewed and who gave me their ideas, insights, and criticisms, the best of which I shamelessly stole. In addition to this report, in 2009 I wrote a, a second article. It appeared in the University of Pittsburgh Law Review. This article focused primarily on the Enforcement Division of the SEC, a subject that I did not discuss in the Chamber report. Unlike the Chamber report, which reflected the collective views of a wide range of people, this article is really my own personal views. In both documents, I attempted to constructively identify what could be done to make the agency a more effective capital market regulator. Now, today I, I am aware that, that one of the focal points is, of course, the SEC's budget and the question of resources. Well, I have to answer that I, like most people, agree that the agency does need more staff to carry out its responsibilities. But while more money and more staff is necessary, I don't think it is sufficient. To do the job well, the agency has to reexamine how it does that job, and I think it has to make changes. I think it is time to, to critically self-examine core functions and recognize most of them just, just haven't been very effective. My concern is that just having more people do more of the same thing in the same way is not the best solution. I think we need fundamental changes in organization, management, and mission definition. Chairman Shapiro has, has identified a number of the initiatives she has undertaken, and I commend her on them. I worked for seven chairmen and four acting chairmen, and I will tell you that with the possible exception of John Shadd, the first chairman I worked with, Chairman Shapiro has probably focused more of her attention on management and organization than any of the other intervening chairmen. But again, these are first steps. I think more needs to be done. Uh, I want to highlight five points that are contained in my written statement. And uh, I don't have time to go through all of them, but if people have questions, I would be happy to do it. I think the agency needs a partial reorganization. I advocate what is referred to internationally as a Twin Peaks approach, one division that deals with all aspects of retail financial services regulation and another division that handles all prudential functions in the division, the so-called safety, soundness, and stability functions. I think the agency needs a chief operating officer. I applaud Chairman Shapiro for appointing one, but I think you have to go further. You need a chief operating officer who really is that and has more than the title. The way I, I distinguish it is when you try and build a house, the architect and the owner design the house, but you need a general contractor to actually get it done, to build it well, and keep it on budget and on time. Uh, I see my time is almost up, so I will just very quickly identify two other things. I think there needs to be substantial changes in enforcement. When you look at Madoff, you have to understand, in my opinion, this was not a question of culpability, of a few bad people doing bad things. Madoff is similar to other failures of the Commission in the past. These are structural issues that go with how the Division of Enforcement frames its responsibilities and conducts those responsibilities. It has to be proactive, not reactive. And its results have to be aimed at remediation, not penalties. Penalties are the function of the Justice Department. And in that respect, I would advocate very strongly beefing up a criminal securities office in the Department of Justice so that the agency doesn't have to rely upon the Southern District of New York, which has limited jurisdiction. And in just in closing, I want to mention what I think is the most important recommendation of all the need for a special study of the securities markets. In 1961, the SEC was similarly troubled. The markets were in similar upheaval. Congress appropriated funds to create a special studies of the securities market, a group of technocrats, experienced people from government and from industry who spent 18 months studying the markets and studying how the SEC fun functioned. They issued a five-volume report that literally for 25 years what was the touchstone for everything the SEC did. I think we need another one. Thank you very much for the time, and I am happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Katz. Uh, Mr. Crimmins, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman McHenry, Chairman Platts, Ranking Member Quigley, and Ranking Member Cummings, thank you for hearing us today. Over the last decade, 
we have seen an explosion in the size and complexity of our capital markets, exponential increases in trading volume, brokers doing thousands of trades in a few seconds instead of a hundred, maybe 100 trades a day, high-speed computer-driven trading strategies, fragmentation of trading away from the exchanges and into dark pools and ECNs, 24-7 globalized stock trading. We have seen investment products become so complex that the sophisticated traders who trade them don't always fully understand what they are, and scary systemic risk that threatens recurring crises. Now, after the crash, we see many investors pulling out and staying out of stocks and mutual funds. Investors are still scared and sidelined with their decimated 401ks. Investor perceptions are critical. These people will be unwilling to continue to rent, risk their capital or risk their capital again if Wall Street's cop on the beat becomes a cop on furlough. Last summer, in the depths of the worst financial crisis in 80 years, Congress recognized that the Securities and Exchange Commission needed twice the budget to be relevant in today's huge, complex, and hypercharged markets. Whatever issues anyone in Congress has with the SEC, I would respectfully suggest that the answer is not to starve it in the wake of the crash. The answer is not to create an environment where it will be easier for the fraudsters to prey on investors. Instead, the answer is for all of us here and now to commit firmly to do whatever it takes to make the SEC the strong and smart overseer that our capital markets deserve to recover and grow. One thing is of paramount importance. Nobody is asking the taxpayer for one dime to fund the SEC. What is often forgotten in the discussion is that American taxpayers pay absolutely nothing to run the SEC each year. Under 1996 legislation adopted by a Republican Congress and a Democratic President, the money to run the SEC comes entirely from Wall Street transaction fees and assessments designed to cover the entire cost of the SEC's budget. Because of this, a substantially increased SEC appropriation paid for with this successful 15-year-old funding mechanism would require no tax dollars whatsoever, and it would add nothing to the deficit. In short, the Wall Street user fee money is already there. Congress just has to let the SEC use it to police Wall Street. Madoff was a tragedy. The SEC missed Madoff, and Chairman Shapiro and others have not tried to evade or run away from that fact. But so did FINRA whose predecessor installed Madoff as its vice chairman, and so did the Justice Department, and so did the New York Attorney General with Madoff right in his own backyard, and so did how many others, including the sophisticated financial services firms that regularly interacted with him. Madoff was an industry icon and idol, and nobody knew that he was really a crook. Yet, through thick and thin, the SEC was out there bringing almost 700 complex cases for enforcement every year against almost 2,000 defendants every year, and with greater funding could have brought far more. We hear criticism of the SEC's recently departed general counsel, David Becker. His power, I would suggest, is misunderstood. He was not the secretary of some cabinet-level department. Instead, he was the general counsel, one of multiple senior advisors, at a five-member bipartisan commission composed of two Republicans, two Democrats, and one independent. But whatever his power, the point is that he did not use it to benefit himself. The month after he left the agency, it still to this day remains unclear exactly how any of the Madoff-related claims are ultimately going to be calculated. And in any event, the Madoff trustee, Irving Picard, reports to the court, not to the SEC, and he will make his own decisions on what he wants to claim. Finally, we need some perspective. What we are talking about is whether the Dorothy Becker estate will get to keep the 500000 that Dorothy originally invested, or whether we will get also to keep some small amount on top, the inflation, inflation adjustment. That seems to be where this is all breaking down and, and, and being discussed. The senior ethics official that Becker consulted with ruled that whatever theoretical conflict this may actually have presented, it did not create such a conflict that he needed to recuse himself based on what was known at that time. The possibility of a claim against this estate of a particular type at some future date was at that time too speculative. Now we know more, of course. And the amount, I'm sorry. 
Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Chapin, you are rep recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And if, if you will pull the microphone to your mouth, it is uh, directional. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. I speak on behalf of approximately 500 Madoff investors whom I represent, and I speak as well on behalf of every American who hopes to save enough money in his lifetime to retire on that money. I speak on behalf of every American who relies upon the brass plaque on his broker's desk, SIPC. We are told when we invest that every account is insured up to $500,000. And yet, SIPC has taken the position in the Madoff case that the law doesn't apply to it. And if I had to grade the SEC's performance with respect to its essential function of protecting investors with respect to the Madoff case, I would give the SEC an F. The SEC, instead of enforcing the law against SIPC, which it is charged by Congress with the obligation to do, instead of enforcing the law, we now know that in January 2009, the SEC agreed with SIPC that for the first time in its history, it would not pay SIPC insurance to each Madoff victim based upon the investor's last statement. SIPC is an insurance entity established by Congress which has the power to assess the Wall Street firms to raise the funds to protect investors. The statute doesn't give SIPC the right to define how it is going to allow a claim. The statute mandates that a claim is based upon the customer's last statement. And yet the SEC joined in SIPC's violation of the statute. This is not just my opinion. This is the opinion of Chairman Garrett, who has proposed H.R. 757. And in proposing H.R. 757, which is simply a clarification of the law, one could view H.R. 757 as a statement to the SEC, you cannot avoid the law, and SIPC cannot avoid the law. Mr. Garrett made a statement when he had introduced this bill that SIPC has violated the law and the trustee in the Madoff case has violated the law. If you recall, in 1970, when SIPA was enacted, investors were encouraged to relinquish the protection of having certificated securities. That was something that Wall Street wanted. And in exchange for relinquishment of that protection, investors were promised SIPC insurance. SIPC insurance was raised to $500,000 in 1978. It was never raised thereafter. But in the Madoff case, SIPC decided that was going to be too expensive for its Wall Street members, and so it was going to try to come up with an entirely new basis for insuring accounts. For the first time in SIPC's history, it decided it didn't insure the balance on the last statement. It only insured the net investment over the life of the account, which might have been 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. There is no evidence that any investor in today's stock market has of what he owns other than the statements he receives from his broker. We don't have the luxury of going back to certificated securities. The Internal Revenue Service relies upon those statements. Every investor relies upon those statements for planning their retirement, for planning the, their estate plans for their children. There is no basis in law for what the SEC did in this case. And this is not a question of insufficient funding for the SEC. This is a question of doing its mission, which is to protect the investor. Now, I am not here to opine on whether or not Mr. Becker had a conflict of interest. I don't think there can be any doubt about it. But whether he advocated the constant dollar adjustment, which obviously reduced his own exposure, or whether he said to the SEC when he came on board in February 2009, you have made an illegal agreement with SIPC, which would have worked to his advantage, his judgment was clouded because everyone in the SEC forgot the law. 
There is one way to remedy this and to restore confidence in the capital markets for the average American, and that is to enact H.R. 757. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I thank the panel for their testimony. And with that, we will begin questioning on our side uh, by Dr. Gosar of Arizona. He is recognized for five minutes. Chairman Shapiro, when David Becker, your brand new general counsel, first came to you in February of 2009 and said, my mother had an account with Bernie Madoff, why didn't you ask him any questions about it? Why didn't you even ask simple questions like, how much money? Congressman, to the best of my recollection, and, and just so I can be clear, I haven't looked at any emails or whether there might be any contemporaneous notes or anything like that from this period of time. So I am recalling back, because our Inspector General is looking at all this, so I am recalling back two years ago. At the best of my recollection was that Mr. Becker told me that his mother, who had passed away years ago, had had an account at Madoff. Um, I did not, because the account was closed years before, um, I did not think that the account of a long-deceased relative would raise an issue of a conflict of interest in Mr. Becker's work. Um, I did expect that he would go to the Ethics Council. Um, he is an experienced government official, government lawyer, served under three chairmen at the SEC. Um, and we use our Ethics Council all the time for, for their advice. I expected him to run it by the Ethics Council and to follow their advice. And, and that is the way it went forward. It, it, it seems that um, in the same, if the same situation existed in a publicly held uh, or traded company that you were investigating, would you turn such a cavalier, uh, have such a cavalier approach to that? Well, it, it's hard for me to imagine this situation. I mean, these are the government ethics rules and the concern about um, an ethics financial. rule, nonetheless. It's very hard to answer in the abstract. Um, it would. Depend it just, on the it rule, just but, seems that there is a very different aspect that um, what is good in, in the private sector or in publicly traded situations is not going well for the government. Let's go to my next question. Ms. Chapman, do you believe that the account valuation method um, that David Becker recommended to the Commission as its attorney would have benefited his personal financial interest? There is no question that the constant dollar approach, which apparently Mr. Becker invented, would benefit him personally and reduce his clawback exposure. But the more significant problem with the conflict of interest that Mr. Becker had is that it had clouded his judgment. The law is absolutely clear that every investor is entitled to SIPC insurance based on his last statement. And Mr. Becker had an obligation as the general counsel of the SEC to make sure that the SEC complied with the law and enforced it against SIPC. And that is the great failure which has caused devastation to all of my clients. Chairman Shapiro, your agency's inspector general compiled a 457-page report about the SEC's failure to undercover, uncover Madoff's Ponzi scheme. That report devotes two sections out of 11 to describing in great detail every possible connection between SEC employees and Madoff. Do you think that your general counsel's receiving funds from a Madoff account would have been uh, appropriate material to the Inspector General or not? Um, that would be um, a much better question for the Inspector General. I have a pretty high level of confidence that he did quite a thorough report on the agency's failures with respect to Madoff. The Inspector General's Madoff report mentions on page 382 that two family members of an employee in the Office of the Internet Enforcement invested $1.5 million and $500,000 respectively with Madoff. The Inspector General found it necessary to make sure that this employee had no involvement in any Madoff examination. Do you think that the Inspector General would have been interested in a similar situation involving your chief lawyer, a senior SEC official who served as general counsel from 2000 to 2002 while the SEC was ignoring whistleblower complaints about Madoff? Um, I, I can't predict. I, can't, I can imagine that he might have been, and of course he is looking at all of these issues now, and I expect that he will thoroughly explore that. Well, I understand that you inherited a, a, a horrific problem, um, but that it always starts with top down. You know, private sector um, businesses always look at accountability within the hierarchy. And it seems like we have a two edged sword here. 
that we should have demanded um, a better accountability. Would you agree? Congressman, I would agree that as I, from where I sit now and understanding all the things that I understand now that I didn't understand in, in 2009, having arrived at the SEC and, and discovered that I had an agency in absolute ruin in some regards on my hands to manage, uh, and not knowing, obviously, all the steps that would be taken by the trustee or the, or the decisions the Commission would make down the road. Um, but knowing those things now, I wish that we had um, done I wish that Mr. Becker had recused himself. Absolutely. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Chairman, the New York Times reported on March 5th of this year that the SEC has declined to enforce the requirement from Dodd-Franks that would make uh, rating agencies subject to expert liability under the securities law. This would make rating agencies uh, liable for faulty ratings. Could you comment on the timeline for implementing this measure? Yes, I would be happy to. Um, the, the way the rule works is that if a rating is in, uh, included in a registration statement for securities, then the rating agency must consent to having liability, and that is the Dodd-Frank requirement. We had pre-existing SEC rules that required for asset-backed securities registration statements that if a rating was used to sell the securities, the rating needed to be included in the registration statement. Rating agencies have absolutely, unequivocally, um, at least the ones that are in existence now, refused uh, to consent. So that made public offerings of asset-backed securities impossible because they couldn't, put, they couldn't get the consent of the rating agencies to include the ratings, but they used the ratings to sell the securities. So we temporarily set aside our rule, our requirement that the asset-backed issuers disclose the ratings in their registration statements because we didn't want to be holding up all public offerings of asset-backed securities and pushing them into the private markets, which we felt were not, um, not as good um, for investors. Um, we are not, right now our staff is working through um, a reconsideration of our disclosure requirements, and I believe that they will recommend that we eliminate our preexisting requirement for including the ratings, and therefore the liability provisions can go forward. We are also hopeful that some of the newer rating agencies that have indicated an interest in becoming registered with us um, will actually be willing to consent, which is, I think, how Congress hoped the law would work. Could you guess on the time frame for that? Um, I can't, but I would be more than happy to, um, I would say over the next couple of months, but I would be happy to get you a more definitive answer right away. Thank you. And you, you talked about the agency that you inherited, and you talked about, well, to a certain extent, the reforms necessary, those you have implemented. But as to Mr. Katz's point, um, whether or not more assets, and, and I, I think you need the assets to do your job, help more than the need for uh, in a sense, restructuring, reforming, reinventing yourself. Uh, are you looking at the agency from that perspective in the broader picture? If you were to start over, what would you do and how would you do it? Absolutely. I, I actually would do, again, many of the things we have already done. Um, this has been an agency that has sort of been taken upside down and shaken pretty hard over the last two years. So new leadership across the board in every major office and division, a new chief operating officer, a new chief ethics counsel, our first ever chief compliance officer. We also restructured our enforcement division and put people into specialized groups where they could get deep expertise to bring enforcement cases more quickly, in particular areas like structured products or the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act or insider trading. We have also restructured our examination program. And both of those, enforcement and examination, largely in response to the failures that were so vividly demonstrated in the Inspector General's report on, on uh, Madoff. We have also um, uh, brought new technology, which is going to be critical to us. We, we have too many people doing low-value work because we don't have the technology. What to, do you mean low-value work? Uh, um, for example, when we bring enforcement cases, we bring in massive amounts of electronic um, data. Um, so that we can look at trading records or we can look at email trans, uh, transmissions between parties who might be sharing non-public information. We need to be able to use um, data analytics to find the important information in all of that, not have people plowing through all that information. When the markets fell so dramatically on May 6, it took us five months to reconstruct trading data because we don't have the capacity in the SEC. Well, to and that, that was the final question, given we have limited time. I mean, are you a technological match 
for those that you are regulating? Not, not at the moment we aren't. We have a phenomenal new chief invest, uh, information <coughs> officer. He is making real progress, I think, but we are a long way from the people that we are regulating in terms of our technical capability. But I think we can get there. I think Thank we you. can put up a good fight anyway. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, I thank the gentleman. I now recognize uh, the Vice Chair of uh, the TARP and Financial Services and Bailout Subcommittee, Mr. Gint of New Hampshire, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Katz, thank you and thank all of uh, the witnesses for being here today. I wanted to direct my first question to you, sir. Um, in your testimony, you talked about the size, structure and complexity of the U.S. capital markets and financial uh, companies that have grown substantially in the past 30 years. And I think what your position is, is that you are comparing the SEC over that same period of time and the fact that it has not grown or changed or modified substantially. Um, but I, I wanted to get a little clarification on that first, if you would. Yes, thank you very much. I, well, obviously, I think everybody would agree that the, the capital markets of today are, you know, exponentially greater. But my point was more directed to the way the SEC is structured. And it is not just a question of size. It is a question of a structure that corresponds to the entities you are regulating. And the point I was making is that in the early 1970s, when basically the current organizational structure of the SEC was last reformed, you had a division of market regulation that focused on stock exchanges and broker-dealers. And you had a division of investment management regulation which focused on mutual funds and investment advisors. And there were two very separate components of the industry, and there really was very little overlap. That no longer exists. Because of consolidation in the industry and the blending of the roles, the, the, the fundamental distinction between a stockbroker who is a commission-based seller of securities and an investment advisor who is an asset under management advisor on a comprehensive portfolio is, is a historical artifact. It doesn't exist. <clears throat> but because you have two divisions applying two different laws, according to a model that no longer exists, you get these anomalies, uh, the fight over fiduciary duty differential. Now, it was embedded in the laws. But more importantly, you had two different divisions who had different ways of thinking about it, and neither of them wanted to compromise. They both wanted to <clears throat> maintain the, their piece of it. And, and does that speak a little bit to the silo effect that, that Absolutely. you have been referring to? You know, the, yeah. I, I used to joke that the silos at the SEC were so real, real that, in fact, they had locked doors, <laughs> and that because all the paper in the agency used to have to come through my office, I actually had a skeleton key that occasionally allowed me to unlock each of the silo doors and get inside it. But most people don't. And turf is a real issue in any organization, no matter what the size. And it is compounded because, remember, you have got different securities laws that were written at different points of time for different segments of the industry. And each division sort of jealously guards the law that it controls. The market has changed. Well, I, I listened to what uh, Chairman Shapiro mentioned in her <clears throat> earlier comments about some of the improvements and modifications and changes that she's made, um, and they sound um, laudable and responsible. That being said, I wonder what type of congressional action may or may not be necessary, given the systemic problem that we have seen uh, with. Uh, with, within the SEC, and I don't want to get into the mm -hmm. specifics, but the things that we have been talking about here, and um, I, I, we have to prevent these from happening again. People in our nation need to have uh, confidence, uh, not just in the SEC, but uh, in the markets as well. And I wonder, uh, sir, what you could say about the type of intervention you feel Congress should be considering. Well, that is a very difficult question for me to answer. And the reason is because, uh, look, I spent my virtually my entire career at the SEC. And I, I think it is very difficult for Congress to micromanage the internal organization operations of a government agency. You, you can set policy, you can give direction. But I think it is dangerous when Congress tells the agency, this is how you get it done. I think the agency really has to take this responsibility on. And Chairman Shapiro has brought in an entirely new team of senior people. I don't know most of them, 
they seem very competent. My hesitation is this. If you rely exclusively on a team of people coming in to affect change, when those people walk out the door, the change walks out with them. You need to change the structure. You need to change the culture. And most importantly, you need the agency to define what it is it's trying to do and how do you measure whether it's gotten it done. You need that discipline. Thank you. But very that's for the agency to do. Thank you, sir. Uh, Chairman Shapiro, I only have a few seconds left. But what assurance can you give us that that new management team is effectively managing and maintaining the, the necessary changes? Well, I have to say I think change starts with leadership, absolutely, and having a whole new leadership team makes an enormous difference. But they are very committed to working together and institutionalizing cooperation and collaboration among all the divisions. So, for example, we now have colleges of regulators for the largest financial institutions. It is no longer just the Trading and Markets Division that looks at them. It is no longer just the examination group. There is a, there is a group of people from, drawn from all over the agency who could have potentially an interest in the health of that financial institution who meet regularly to talk about what is going on in that company, to look at the financials, to uh, meet with the um, staff of, of that financial institution. So College of Regulators is just one example. We have task forces across the agency. We are merging in some of our offices um, and will eventually in all of them our examination programs for investment advisors and broker-dealers, which Mr. Katz mentioned. And I should finally say that um, we, we have um, just commissioned, and I believe it is even going to be released today, Dodd-Frank required us to hire an independent consultant to do a very in-depth study of the SEC's organizational structure, and that will be released today. And I fully expect that there will be some really helpful ideas there for us to further improve how we operate. The gentleman's time has expired. And with that, I recognize the ranking member, uh, Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me thank all of you for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time to come in. Um, Chairman uh, Shapiro, the SEC plays a critical role in protecting investors and ensuring that our financial markets operate effectively. And you have stated that freezing the SEC budget impedes the agency's ability to meet its mission, which is to protect investors, maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and facilitate capital to information. Can you put that in concrete terms for us? If the SEC does not have the budget to properly oversee capital markets, how would it affect your staffing? Uh, yes, sir, I would be happy to. I think the two things that are most severely impacted by a limited budget at the SEC are our capability to hire the new kinds of talent and expertise we need, economists, people who worked in hedge funds on trading desks, financial analysts, the new expertise that will help us keep up with what is going on in the marketplace. And the second is the fact that it will slow down um, and really um, hurt our efforts at reforming our technology, at bringing it up to speed, at giving us the capacity to do the things that we need to do in order to keep up with Wall Street. And I know we will never meet, meet their budgets. I understand that. I have no expectation and don't believe the American public should pay for us to have a $3 billion a year technology budget. But we have to do much better than we have been able to do. And so I think those are the two primary things that are really impacted. It plays out in lots of other ways. And, um, when examiners, when we don't have a sufficient travel budget, examiners can't travel to go into that mutual fund where most Americans hold their investing wealth and examine the mutual fund's books and, and records. They can't go to the investment advisor or to the broker dealer. And so in little ways, um, the lack of resources plays out. But the really fundamental ways are bringing in those people that we need to really reform and transform the agency so people know that we have at least a fighting chance at staying on top of what's going on on Wall Street. And so we can also respond when the emergencies come along, as we saw on May 6th, when the market just absolutely fell apart, scared people very badly uh, in the retail investing public and in the institutional investing public as well. We need the capability to respond to those things very, very quickly. Right. What about the uh, flexibility? Do you have that? For instance, um, um, if there is a crisis situation and you need a specific kind of uh, person uh, and that 
in order to get that person, you might need additional kind of resources to be able to track who you need to do the job at that particular time. Do you have that kind of flexibility? And, um, we have had some flexibility over the last two years because Congress has, has been generous in our budgets, but if we are continue at the CR level um, or our cut, the answer to that is no. I mean, May 6 required us to go out and bring in um, experts to help us analyze and, and um, go through all the trading data so we could reconstruct for the public to see what was happening every second in the marketplace when the, when the Dow dropped 900 points or 500 points in, in just the matter of a few minutes. Um, it is responding to emergencies is one of the things I do worry about, and um, that is where we, we lose flexibility if, if we don't um, have a sufficient uh, appropriation. Right. Thank you very much. On that note, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And with that, I rec recognize Mr. Mack of Florida for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I uh, also want to thank the, uh, the panel for being here today and um, give us an opportunity to get uh, your insights and, and ask a few questions uh, on a very serious uh, topic. Uh, and I would like to start with uh, Chairman Shapiro, if I might. Uh, do you feel as chair of the agency, that it ultimately is your responsibility uh, to ensure that all of the employees are acting in accordance with SEC employee conduct standards? Um, I have responsibility for the agency in that sense. I, I cannot tell you that with 3,800 employees, I can take individual responsibility for each and every one to ensure that they are following the requirements um, the way they should be. But it is Ultimately, it is your responsibility as the chair of the SEC. Ultimately, I am resp responsible for the agency's okay. conduct. If, if, you, uh, if I could direct uh, your attention to slide number four, Chairman Shapiro, are you familiar with the rule that is being presented on the screen? Yes. Um, well, after reading through uh, my material and hearing your testimony, it seems to me that um, you weren't completely knowledgeable of this rule at the time you hired David Becker. So please allow me to read, read it so everyone in the room uh, can understand the entire rule. The Securities and Exchange Commission has been entrusted by Congress with the protection of the public interest in a highly significant area of our national economy. In view of the effect which Commission action frequently has on the general public. It is important that members, employees, and special government employees maintain unusually high standards of honesty, integrity, impartiality, and conduct. They must be constantly aware of the need to avoid situations which might result either in actual or apparent misconduct or conflicts of interest and to conduct themselves in the official relationships in a manner which commands the respect and confidence of their fellow citizens. Chairman Shapiro, were you familiar with this rule at the time that you received David Becker as your general counsel? Uh, I, I, I can't tell you whether I had read it. I have been in and out of government um, most of my career, so I am generally aware of the ethics rules. But I will tell you that this oh, is. Well, hold on, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, because I, I only have a little bit of time. Um, a moment ago, you said you were familiar with the rule. Uh, well, I, I am, but you, you just asked me had I was I aware of it at the time that David Becker arrived at the commission, and I'm just telling you, I can't rec recall whether I had reread the rule recently at that point or not. But, it but, is, through, but throughout your time in the 80s and the 90s, and this is you are yes, familiar I'm, with this rule. I am okay. generally aware of the ethics rules, okay. and that it is each employee's obligation. And regarding David Becker's work with the Madoff case, do you believe that Mr. Becker was sufficiently aware of the need to avoid actual or apparent conflicts of interest? I believe that um, he I, I want to be very careful. I believe he did what he thought was appropriate and what was required of him, going to the Ethics Council and seeking advice, getting that advice and following it. Do I wish now that he had been more sensitive to the potential for this issue to raise uh, a, an appearance of a conflict? Yes. I, I wish that that had happened. All right. Let me, just a few more questions. Do you think that you are sufficiently aware of the need to avoid actual or apparent conflicts of interest? On my part, yes. I believe I am. Okay. Quickly, um, you have said now a couple times, I think, that um, 
uh, you wish that uh, Mr. Becker would have recused himself. Uh, is that because of the fallout, uh, or, is, or do you really believe he should have recused himself? I, I believe that, as I said, at the time, from my perspective, a closed account from a long since deceased relative, it didn't appear to me to raise a conflict of interest. But I, I believe now, knowing what we know now, not because of the fallout, though that's very real, but because if we could connect the dots and look ahead and see what all the steps would have been, that yes, it would have been appropriate to have recused. Uh, let, me, let me say this. Um, uh, and also, I heard you say earlier that uh, you kind of referred to the budget as kind of the reasons why some of these mistakes happened. How much does it cost to follow that rule? That is a, that's a personal initiative. It doesn't really cost anything. So, but, the, so the argument about the budget is, as it pertains to this rule, doesn't hold water. And, and let me be clear. Let, I let me, let me, so the, the argument about the budget that you, in your opening statement that you talked about, really doesn't pertain to this rule. No. No. And I, I didn't mean to suggest in any way that it did. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. And with that, I recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. I, I don't want that to be left hanging. I never heard you, and I have heard all of your testimony, and I have read your testimony, uh, Ms. Shapiro. You, you never made that allegation. I, I want to make that clear. I haven't heard it. And I think it is a very unfair statement. Let me uh, go on. Ms. Shapiro, I, I must tell you, Chairman Shapiro, that when I uh, was talking to my staff, Matter of fact, we were emailing back and forth at 4 a.m. this morning about this case because it does trouble me to a degree with regard to the appearance of a conflict of interest. And I think when we hear Ms. Chapman, her, what she's had to say, um, that shows you why and I'm sure you, you see it, why we have to make sure that we don't even, don't even have the appearance. Because what happens is that every decision made by Mr. Becker then becomes suspect. It is my favorite author, Covey, who in the book The Speed of Trust says that once trust is lost, everything moves more slowly. And so, I cannot begin to tell you how pleased I was when you walked in here today and said, we will go beyond what may be required. That is so very, very important. In my office, I have five people. Whenever there is an ethics question, they all have to agree. And if one vetoes, is out the door. Why? Because the public is looking over our shoulders. We want to do the right thing, and we want to make sure that it is right. Now, so you, you, you see, so this has been a major wake-up call, hasn't it? And, and, and I, you know, here in this committee, it's so easy for us to get into a gotcha mode. But I must tell you, after I read about what you had done at the SEC since you've been there, and having sat on this committee and watched Mr. Cox and what he did with this organization, and how it went down under him to see you come and try to sweep up the mess, I must commend you. But the sad part about it is that one of these little incidents basically can almost destroy that trust. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so I want you to commit. Is your, is your mic on? I want you to commit to this, uh, this committee, if you will. I mean, tell me if this these incidents come up again, tell us the difference of how you might approach it. I mean, and I, and I, and I understand what you, what you did. You, you, the fellow comes to you, he tells you, look, years ago I got a disinheritance and now I've, uh, you know, and, and, he, and he wants to know about a conflict. You listen to it for a while, you've got 3,800 employees to deal with, you, you hear him, and then you say, you know what, the expert on this is the ethics guy. Make sure you check with him. And he, he got an opinion. So, how would you deal with this differently now? 
looking at looking backwards. Well, I, we have a new Ethics Council, first of all, who is doing a sort of a top to bottom review of our program. But I think we, I need to work with all of our employees and communicate with all of our employees about a heightened sensitivity to issues like this, that we have to be I have worked so hard in the last two years to try to put this agency back on the right path and to earn the trust of the public. And you are right, a small thing like this, not so small thing like this, can really set us back. And it is not fair to 3,800 hardworking employees. It is just like when um, somebody mentioned in their opening statement that a, a, an employee, employees had been um, viewed pornography at the SEC. It infuriates me because most people there are working their hearts out day and night to try to do the right thing, and it, it hurts the reputation of every single one of us. So I have to work with our employees to make sure that we increase their sensitivity to issues like this. And I think with our new Ethics Council and their review of, of uh, the program and how it might be strengthened, we will get um, some good advice. And I think the Inspector General is likely to have some recommendations that will be very helpful, too. One of the things that I am hoping is that with regard to, I mean, I read in your testimony where you were talking about technology and trying to keep up with these ever-changing transactions and how complicated they are becoming. And I'm, and you, I want to make sure that you have all the resources you have to address this, because so many of our constituents, both on both sides, lost a lot of money. And like Mr. Katz said, I, mean, I think it was Mr. Kremens, they need confidence to reenter this system uh, of, of, of uh, stock. I agree. Thank you. I thank the ranking member. And uh, with that, we yield five minutes to Mr. Ross of Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, as a kid, I, I always wanted to be a lawyer, and, and fortunately, I found a law school that would take me, and I went to law school, and I, and I always had a, a deep-seated respect for the sanctity of the law, so much so that I, I was uh, gratified that the American Bar Association and my State Bar Association required not only a course but a, an examination in the Code of Professional Responsibility. And, Mr. Shapiro, I understand that you, too, are a lawyer and that even though you inherited quite a mess uh, at a time of, of, of great um, disarray at the SEC, uh, it, it begs my question is, is that as a lawyer, uh, when Mr. Becker came to you, did you not think that, that a further investigation should be made? Uh, as a lawyer, I, when I have, I mean, we do conflicts checks. We, 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 we make sure of that. And it just seems to me that if, if, if further in, in, inquiries had been made at that time, uh, that this might have been avoided. I, I don't disagree with you that if further inquiries had been made, this might have been avoided. I, I can only say what I said at the beginning is that when he raised it with me that he had had a closed account, um, I didn't know if it had been a net winner account, a net loser account or anything else, from a deceased relative, uh, it didn't raise for me a conflict of interest. But the, the fact that he asked for a, a, a waiver mm. from his subordinate, I think, it, it is indicative of, of, of a problem, an inherent internal problem there from an ethical standpoint. Well, my understanding, I, I don't know that he asked for a waiver. And again, I, I have no um, access to any contemporaneous documents of any sort. Uh, he, then, he asked whether or not he had a conflict and was advised that he did not have a conflict that would um, cause Did you know who was him. advising him that there, would be no, that there was no conflict? It, it was the Ethics Council of the SEC at that time, no longer the Ethics Council. Right. And, and that, as general counsel, that would be under him, would it, would it not? I believe that is the case in most agencies. Yeah. And do you feel that this would be avoided again in the future? I mean, any of this type of? Sure. Well, I would love to say absolutely, without a doubt. I, I agree. But it would be my, um, my very strong hope that with a very strong new Ethics Council that we hired from the Treasury Department, that um, with long government experience, with a revamping of our programs and with some additional education and training for our people, I would hope and expect that we could I agree. Uh, avoid I, I this. I think the American public needs that assurance of credibility is going to be there. Mr. Rissinger, um, uh, with regard to human resources, uh, are, are, the, are your employees, they all part of the general schedule in terms of compensation? Uh, Congressman, actually, we have a separate pay schedule that we received from legislation from Congress back in 2001, 2002. We and were you subject to the pay freeze that the, uh, that the President uh, issued out? Yes, we are. Now, do, do, however, do you also have uh, so that really just affected the cost of living increases, didn't it? 
it, it does affect the cost of living increases. What about within pay grade or step increases? Did it affect that? We, we have a, a merit pay process that is the equivalent of uh, step increases uh, for the rest of government. So that is technically not affected by the pay freeze. And in your disciplinary procedures, um, do, do, let me ask you this. What is a probationary period for any employee? It is generally a year. One year. And uh, after one year, then, uh, if there is a disciplinary situation, is there a, a presumption uh, in favor of the employee or, uh, if, if they have been uh, found of a violation or alleged violation of any uh, personnel uh, policies? Right. The, the, uh, the Federal laws that we have to follow in, in terms of disciplining employees uh, set out a number of standards that we have to go through. There are actually 12 factors that you have to look at when you are issuing discipline. Uh, and one of them is a factor that says, is this the level of discipline that is necessary to stop the behavior and not more than that? So there is a presumption that you are um, taking a, a preventative or corrective step and not necessarily a punitive and step. And these would have been the same procedures employed in those that were involved in the viewing of pornography, is that correct? That is correct. And only one person was fired as a result of that? We, we've had, uh, of, of the cases we've had uh, since 2005, um, 50 percent or 51 percent have either resigned, retired, or have proposed removals in place. Uh, we've had uh, a number of suspensions and reprimands as well. What is the attrition rate in, in your department, in your agency? In, in the agency, it's, uh, in, in normal years, it's 7 to 8 percent. Uh, in the last couple of years, because of the, uh, the economy, it's been in the 3.5 to 4 percent range. And how does that compare with Federal agencies? The other federal agencies. I believe if, if we're talking overall, just, just, just attrition just, in general, yeah. I, I think that's that's pretty pretty equivalent with other agencies. Okay. Last question, Mr. Chatham, um, with regard to um, uh, the, the the Madoff situation, and in, in, in specifically, uh, I saw where you put them on notice, and you wanted to uh, of what was going on. It, what action would you think would have been necessary in order for you to? I see my time's up. Uh, for, for, what action would you have requested be done in order to avoid this conflict? Well, under the statute, Congress uh, mandated that the SEC go into court and enforce the law against SIPC. And that is precisely what I asked Ms. Shapiro to do in my April 2, 2009 letter. And in fact, when Ms. Shapiro testified on July 14 before the Subcommittee on Capital Markets that she was going to do everything in her power to provide the maximum SIPC coverage for all investors, I assumed that she was, in fact, going to follow my request. But now I have learned that in, in January of 2009, the SEC had already agreed with SIPC's de, uh, denial of SIPC insurance to more than half of the victims. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Yarmuth of Kentucky for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks to all the witnesses for your testimony. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, I have been uh, plowing my way through the Financial Crisis Inquiry Report which um, is anything but bedtime reading. It, it, it will not put you to sleep, I guarantee you that. matter of fact, quite the contrary. Uh, I am sure that, uh, Chairman Shapiro, that you have, you are aware of what the report concluded, particularly with regard to the SEC. And I, I was interested in an assessment of, of where you think you still need to go to make sure that the failings in the system as it, it concerned your agency uh, won't recur. Well, as, as I, I have not looked at the report recently, but um, it obviously focused a lot on the failures of the SEC's consolidated supervision program for the five largest investment banks, all of which during the financial crisis essentially disappeared or converted to bank holding companies and are under the regulation of the Fed. I think there are a lot of lessons, and I testified before the FCIC about the failures of the agency. Um, uh, with respect to that program, there are a couple of things. One is that it was a voluntary program, um, a voluntary regulatory program, which I think, um, in my view, doesn't work very well. Um, we had um, not sufficient um, resources uh, um, uh, devoted to the regulation of the five largest investment banks. We didn't have um, people with the right kind of expertise. And I think in some ways, the perhaps the most important thing is it required a very different kind of supervision than the SEC has traditionally done. It required prudential supervision as opposed to the SEC's going on site, doing an examination, leaving, and then perhaps bringing an enforcement case. And we didn't have the right mindset within the agency, I think, for that kind of constant 
prudential oversight approach that was really necessary. Um, there was um, a lack of management focus, I think, um, with respect to the program. Uh, there was a willingness to believe what um, uh, our, our people were being told by some of the leaders in some of those financial institutions that failed, a lack of um, skepticism, which I think really hurt, hurt us as well. That program was discontinued by my predecessor, uh, uh, Chairman Cox. So with regard to the present situation, because most people who, have, who observe the, the, the um, situation now agree, I think, that uh, the situation in terms of too big to fail, the, the largest investment banks have in fact gotten larger, and that the, the, the Wild West uh, atmosphere in terms of, of um, risk taking and so forth may have not been curtailed at all. Do you, is this a concern that you share? Is, are you, um, and anybody else who's on the panel is welcome to respond as well, because uh, looking at corporate, uh, the Wall Street profit picture and so forth, it looks like there hasn't been a whole lot of change in behavior. Well, I do, I do think I can speak perhaps most particularly to the over-the-counter derivatives market, where we have a very direct responsibility. Although much progress is being made internationally with respect to accounting standards. Uh, and other prudential measures. Um, but um, getting the over-the-counter derivatives market into a transparent marketplace so that regulators can understand the buildup and concentration of risk in financial institutions I think is going to be a very, very important piece of this. We are working through those rules, uh, as is the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Um, about half of them or so have been proposed, and I would expect that while we are going to miss for some of them the July 21st deadline, we will get um, them over the finish line over the course of the, of the rest of this year, and then there will obviously be implementation um, and phasing periods to go through. But I think that that will make a difference. I think the work the FDIC is doing with the Fed and others on living wills and, and plans for financial institutions to wind down their business appropriately will also make a very big difference, and then, of course, the capital requirements. Uh, just a final question on that, on that, um, that subject. Are you um, confident that the legislature, we talked about the problem potentially with resources and, and the dangers that would uh, ensue if your budgets were cut, your budget was cut, but are you confident that the legislative action that was taken in Dodd-Frank is sufficient or that there are things that we yet need to do to make sure that we don't have a situation recur as it did two years ago? I think it makes um, large strides towards filling the gaps that existed in the regulatory regime. I will say that um, one of my concerns about the budget is that we don't have the capacity to operationalize the rules that we are putting into place. So um, getting you know, swap market participants registered and the swap data analyzed and market surveillance taken care of, those are things that, that we will have to put off. But, um, I think it um, is incumbent upon all of us as regulators who see these markets close up to continue to tell Congress where we think the issues are, where perhaps Dodd-Frank wasn't the right approach, uh, and where we think there are still gaps. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman. And with that, I yield five minutes to the Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Chair, uh, I just went over to the Business Roundtable and back. So I had the opportunity to see about one-third of, uh, of corporate America's profits in that room, uh, almost all public companies, probably all public companies except one, all regulated by the SEC. And uh, I was there talking about impediments to job creation. I am going to give you a little relief from the question du jour here for a moment and ask, Dodd-Frank is not perfect, and it was not what you might call uh, a low-cost, low-budget way to get better performance with less cost. You have asked for a 28 percent budget increase. In fact, if you had only the budget increase necessary to do the work you were not doing as well as you wanted to without all the new losses, what would that budget increase be in your estimation? In other words, what would it cost to do it right without piling on new regulations when there is no question there have been problems properly enforcing your existing portfolio? 
Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd have to actually do the math, but, but maybe this helps. When we um, did our 2012 request, we viewed um, 40 percent of the um, positions, and it was a total of 780 positions or 584 full-time equivalents. We viewed 40 percent of those as going to our ongoing programs, um, and that is 312 positions, and 60 percent going to um, Dodd-Frank implementation, so hedge fund uh, oversight, um, over-the-counter derivatives, municipal advisors, whistleblower program, clearing agencies, and so forth. And to follow up on that quickly, the, uh, uh, the transparency elements that were asked for and agreed on by SEC and other agencies uh, never got into Dodd-Frank. So you don't have a common mandate for reporting for transparency uh, that had been worked out in the conference and then didn't happen. How much, from this committee's standpoint, we are interested, how much more efficient, and you could answer for the record if you are not completely ready today, how much savings could you get if, in fact, there was transparent interoperability both inward and, and whenever possible, out to the public for oversight? Um, that is a great question, and I would like to answer it for the record, because I, I do think it is important that we have, um, particularly when you have a market like the over-the-counter derivatives market with two regulators in the same space, that we try to be as consistent as we possibly can and leverage each other if, as effectively as we can. So if I could come back to you on that, I would like to. I, I appreciate that, and I, and I want to give you an opportunity to be thoughtful, because that is a major initiative of this committee on a bipartisan basis in the last Congress that didn't happen, and we would like to renew it, but we would certainly take your input. And then I guess in the remaining two minutes, I do want to ask you, Mr. Becker's conduct in retrospect was not a good idea. It certainly has not led to confidence in the independence, transparency, and non-biased behavior of, of the SEC when we look through the taillight. How can we know that the changes that you are asking to be reviewed are going to clearly eliminate anything like this in the future? Where do we get the confidence in that? Well, Congressman, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think it's a it's a fair question, and I think um, you and I have had many conversations, and I try to be very transparent and upfront. We will um, obviously be public about what our Inspector General finds and what recommendations he makes, what our new Ethics Council finds as, as she reviews our program and recommendations she makes. Um, we will be happy to come back and talk to Congress about those findings and those recommendations and see if we can develop some metrics that would actually help us figure okay. out whether we are getting it right. Now, your Ethics Council served under the General Counsel, career position, but under the General Counsel, that is correct? Yes. Would you consider moving that to be independent direct report so that there would only be one person, a political appointee like yourself, that would be between the public and ethics questions rather than having a general counsel who has a number of jobs. You don't have to answer that today, but I would like you to consider that uh, in so many different HR situations in the private sector, there is a clear independence of HR, which is a lot of the questions. The question of conflict was more than a legal question, particularly when it included somebody who, in fact, was the boss of the person they went to for this 25-minute this session and, and clearance. So give that some thought. I won't ask for an answer today. I will do that. Uh, finally, as the time runs out, we on the committee want to work to try to be helpful. We realize we only have a portion of the portfolio that you see. You see much more at the financial regulatory and, and financial oversight of, of another committee. But the question I have for you is, in our conduct of this investigation, as we look at Mr. Becker's uh, total portfolio of money, other things he may have done, and how this r might have affected or not affected uh, the Madoff Trust, will you promise your cooperation to this committee today? I, I will promise my cooperation to the, to the fullest extent I, I can. I don't know that I can compel him in any way to do anything. But he's already come in voluntarily, and, and we have the ability to compel him. But it, it's really making sure that we can have a, a quick and transparent. Your IG would normally uh, be willing to share any information that was not directly related to a referred criminal uh, referral and so on. So anything you can do to, to pledge to help us will allow us to move from where we are as quickly as possible onto something else. Yes. And, and that's why I asked today. Yes, of course, Thank I'll help. Thank you, and I thank you all for your indulgence. Yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Connolly of Virginia, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, uh, Chairman Shapiro, aren't you the chairman who appointed the Inspector General who, in fact, is charged with investigating Mr. Becker? Uh, no, sir. He was uh, appointed by my predecessor. By your predecessor. And that investigation continues? Yes, I requested. Ah, you requested. Excuse the, me. Yes, I requested the investigation. You requested it. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, thank you. Um, we just heard a line of questioning asking you to look at a budget without additional regulation uh, that was burdensome and so forth. Um, the Dodd Frank legislation added some regulation in areas that heretofore had not been regulated at all. Is that not correct, Chairman Shapiro? Yes, that is absolutely correct. For example, take derivatives. How big are derivatives? What is the value of, deriv of the derivatives market? Last some number I saw $600 trillion, I believe. I am sorry. Did you say trillion? Yes, sir. And it is entirely trillion. unregulated until Dodd-Frank passed. Is that correct? It is, yes, largely unregulated. Whatever could go wrong with an entirely unregulated $600 trillion market? Well, we saw some things um, that went wrong, and um, presumably that is what motivated the Dodd-Frank so, so maybe that is one of those burdensome additional pieces of regulation we are just going to have to put up with. Um, that burdensome additional regulation uh, requires SEC to staff up and to acquire the requisite expertise to, in fact, enforce the regulation you are not charged with. Is that correct? Yes, we believe so. We are able to do the rule writing that has been ongoing this year, but to operationalize those rules, we need additional staff. We heard Mr. Katz in his testimony say that simply having more SEC staffers do the same thing would not protect investors or promote capital formation. How many areas of additional or new regulation are requiring you to ramp up in terms of expert staffing? Well, we, we um, obviously have derivatives, um, hedge fund regulation. Um, we are creating a new whistleblower office, although that is work that um, we, we need more help with but, but is not um, unknown to us. We have to increase our um, oversight of credit rating agencies under the Act, and we have to register a whole new category of registrant in the municipal securities markets called municipal advisors. So there are half a dozen or so new areas for us um, to undertake uh, regulation. Well, just listening to you tick off that list, none of those sound like frivolous, burdensome additional pieces of regulation. They, they sound like thoughtful additions to the regulatory framework in light of the biggest meltdown on Wall Street in 80 years. Would you share that view? Well, I, I do think all of these areas are ones that needed to be addressed. And, and as we write the rules, we are working very hard. Uh, in collaboration with other regulators, but also with the public, with investors in the industry, to make sure that we write as sensible rules as we possibly can. Mr. Katz, would you share that view? Or is this just another example of having simply, quote, more SE staffers doing the same thing? I, I, there is there's a, a, a qualitative nuance difference in what I said and I think the way you characterized it. it the agency has an enormously large number of new areas of regulatory authority. The question is, when you go about regulating hedge funds or you go about regulating the municipal securities market, are you going to regulate hedge funds exactly the way you regulate investment advisors, which is arguably what they are, or investment companies, which is a sort of close cousin? And my point is, that if you look at the way the Commission has regulated advisors and regulated mutual funds, it hasn't been terribly effective. So if you take the same approach for hedge funds, yes, that would be doing the same thing in those approaches, even if it is a new substantive responsibility with a new category of registrant. Would you say, Mr. Katz, that some of the problem preceding the Wall Street meltdown in September of 2008, for example, had to do, frankly, with the quality of the appointees, namely a whole bunch of people who didn't believe in regulation in the first place and therefore didn't do it. I, I, I have to tell you that there is an old saying at the SEC that, that the commissioners decide the policy, but ultimately it is the staff that decide what it means and how it gets done. And it, it, 
One of the interesting things about the SEC and the, the relationship with, between commissioners and the staff is that it's a close relationship. And because the commission is a bipartisan body, you are always going to get five people with diverging points of view, some of whom will support the staff, some of whom will disagree with the staff. I, I can't think of an occasion where you had five commissioners on one side of the table and the staff on the other side at loggerheads. That doesn't happen. You invariably get some supportive commissioners, some commissioners are critical, and you also get that divergence of view among the staff. The financial regulation is never a question of identifying a single right answer. Thank you, Mr. Katz. Unfortunately, my time is up. I would love to pursue this uh, further, uh, but I certainly believe that uh, the narrative that somehow SEC is uh, treading into waters uh, it has no business treading into, uh, is fallacious. If anything, we needed uh, more people guarding the hen house. And if we are going to talk about the fox guarding the hen house, that may have been true in the 2008 period of time. It is not true today. I thank the Chair. Excuse me, Chairman, if you might indulge me. There is just Please. one very quick point I wanted to make that Mr. Yarmouth brought up, and that was the question of the Consolidated Supervised Entities Regulation process of the SEC. And, and there is a lot of confusion about that. It was a voluntary process. The reason it was a voluntary process is not because of a deregulatory attitude at the SEC. It is because the Commission sought from Congress the authority to make it a mandatory process as part of the uh, uh, graham leach Bliley bill, which eliminated Glass-Steagall. Congress explicitly prohibited the Commission from making it a mandatory process. The Commission had a weak hand. It played the weak hand as best it could. Thank the gentleman. Um, I yield five minutes to myself. Um, I chair the, the Subcommittee on Government Organization Efficiency and Financial Management. And so um, I am going to focus on a related but slightly different area um, that relate to our jurisdiction. And um, it goes back to I had the privilege of chairing this same subcommittee from 2003 to 2007. We had a, um, a subcommittee hearing in July of 2003 about the SEC, about financial management of the SEC, about internal controls. And um, we heard testimony at that point that um, they had just put in a new financial management system in 2002. And in the testimony of the executive director, uh, James McConnell, at the time, uh, in July of 2003, saying that we have this new system and that we are going to be certified basically um, in 2004. Uh, January 2004 for audited financial statements. Here we are seven years later plus, and we are now talking about the same thing, a new system uh, using a DOT enterprise system uh, to put in place a new system. Um, I, guess, I guess my first question, and uh, Chairman Shapiro, I um, appreciate the, the changes you have made and, and the COO, uh, new Chief Operating Officer, and other leadership changes and, and systemic uh, changes within the uh, SEC. But why should the American people believe that when we were told seven years ago we got it right and we were going to be able to go forward, how is it different today? Um, thank you. My, my understanding is that that was the momentum system, I believe, and it was deployed nine or ten years ago, and that it did it in the beginning meet the agency's needs. But then over time, the agency deferred upgrading um, over many years, and as a result, it began to lack the functionality that was necessary to do the job. Gaps were created, workarounds were developed, and as a result, um, the SEC ended up with uh, two material weaknesses in its fin uh, controls over financial reporting in our audit, which is a disgraceful position for the Securities and Exchange Commission to be in. Um, so with our new Chief Operating Officer, our new Chief Financial Officer, and our new Chief Information Officer, we made the decision that rather than incur the risks of developing a new system at the SEC, perhaps not really a core competency for us, that we would be better served by outsourcing financial management. And so we went through a process and we identified the Department of Transportation, which is a, a, an authorized Federal shared service yeah. provider used by the GAO for their financial management system, and made the decision that the best way for us to remediate our material weaknesses, generate the kind of reporting that we need, 
minimize all these manual workarounds and all of this would be to outsource to them. And I, I think it is the right decision for the taxpayer, and I think it is the right decision for the SEC. The uh, follow-up related to that is in the audit that was done at the end of this past year, uh, clean opinion um, but a failure to sign off on the internal controls. Right. Um, I guess two uh, related questions. First, um, how would you describe the internal effort to get the clean opinion other than the internal controls? Uh, and I asked it in the sense of in July of 2003, SEC said it was a heroic end of the year effort. It wasn't because we had a system in place that allowed us to, all right, hey, here's the data, we're ready to go. Was there again a, a heroic end of the year effort to be able to have that audit? Well, um, I think there were some heroics involved. I can't compare to 2003, but I think we did put together a senior team of people to really shepherd the process through. They were diligent and they stuck with it. Um, but they are also very much on board for this decision to outsource. The, the um, and internal controls, not to last year uh, in uh, Dodd Frank, did it require the auditor sign off on the internal controls. But for almost 20 years uh, under the Federal Manager's Financial Integrity Act, uh, adopted in 82, um, we have said that we, um, actually over 20 years, that we have we've had to have uh, strong internal controls. And so although it wasn't required to be signed off on, um, I assume you are very conscious of the fact that it wasn't a new requirement that you have good internal controls, it was just a new requirement that it be signed off on by the auditor. And, whoever has been overseeing those internal control oh. systems uh, uh, clearly were not fulfilling their responsibilities. A absolutely. And under our, our uh, Chief Operating Officer, we will um, both deal with the audit issues with respect to internal controls, but also the attendant business processes. So it is not just a technology answer for us. It is going to have to be business process reengineering uh, process as well. I am going to try to squeeze in two more questions here in 20 seconds. Uh, in your testimony, you talk about uh, the follow-on person that you have for uh, the audit recommendations yes. of your IG and GAO. Um, and in your testimony, you, you state that um, uh, you have appointed an audit follow-up official and empowered her to ensure that agency managers are held accountable for timely and appropriate follow-up. How are they being held accountable? One of the things I get frustrated is we find something that went wrong and I have asked for many years now and said, was anyone disciplined, was anyone fired for not doing what they were supposed to do? Sure. What, so, in what way are they being so held we're accountable? Very, we're very closely tracking audit recommendations, both from GAO and from our Inspector General. And I can tell you that in my two years as Chairman, we have successfully closed 350 Inspector General recommendations compared to 190 in the prior two years. So we are aggressive about doing it. And I will tell you that the Inspector General, um, report in his uh, semiannual report, um, also talks about our progress with respect to closing uh, recommendations and whether there has been any management disagreement with his recommendations. And uh, so he is quite on top of it and quite well, transparent. And, and that is, I think, critical here going forward. And, and what my subcommittee, what we are going to look at is especially staying on top of those recommendations and especially on internal controls. And it goes to the, the broader issue discussed here about ethics and that if you don't have internal controls, that is the foundation for not just good financial management, for good an ethics okay. environment. I agree completely. And, and so we, uh, as a subcommittee and, and with Chairman McHenry, a partner with him here today, that is really what we are going to be looking at and following up. So. Uh, I will yield back and yield now to uh, Ms. Speer from California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for your participation in this hearing. I was particularly impressed by Mr. Katz and Mr. Crimmins' um, testimony. I am somewhat surprised because I am looking at the, the title of the um, hearing and the sign above the Chairman's head that reads, Can American Taxpayers Trust Today's SEC? to manage itself and do its job. And I thought it might be interesting to um, substitute Congress and ask the same question and see if we would fare as well. Um, Chairman Shapiro, having served over two years on the Financial Services Committee, I have watched you, and I think you are truly committed to doing the right thing. Before you came back as chair under Chairman Cox, the number of actual uh, enforcement actions at the SEC was reduced by 80 percent, and the number of disgorgement actions were reduced by 60 percent. Um, a stunning failure at a time when all the mischief was going on with Wall Street. 
So um, we look back at the savings and loan crisis and we recognize that referrals from various regulators, there were 10,000 of them. And of those 10,000, there were 1,000 of them that turned into convictions and 500 people went to jail. And these were CEO level folks that went to jail. The American people are looking at us, looking at Congress, looking at you and saying, who is going to jail? Who is being charged? And, you know, the, the truth is there hasn't been a lot. So my first question is, have you made any referrals to the Justice Department, to the U.S. Attorney as a result of the Wall Street meltdown? Um, I'm, I'm confident that we have. I, I, I guess I would like to supplement the record, if I might, on that. I just I don't know the numbers or the, or the details about it, because, um, of course, as you know, we don't have criminal prosecution right. authority, although we have continued to bring a relatively high number of cases and some very large impact cases coming out of the financial crisis in the past year. So you, were, you will get back to the committee and, and happy actually to. tell us how many referrals you have made. Um, the, the CEO of um, Galleon is, is being tried now. Um, Mr. Gupta, who is a director um, of a significant Wall Street um, firm, evidently is being looked at as having shared insider information, although he didn't appear to have acted on it. Have any actions by the SEC been taken against those two individuals? Um, we filed um, a proceeding against Mr. Gupta last week, and we have filed multiple proceedings coming out of the Galleon investigation over the course of the last uh, six months or so. In um, 2004 and 2005, the GAO said to the SEC, that it should um, take a look at and close its revolving door. The SEC then reported back to the GAO that it had done that, although the GAO now says that that never happened. So the reverse situation of Mr. Becker is the fact that you have staff that work within the SEC um, and then they are lured away mm. by lucrative um, salaries outside. And in fact, oftentimes, um, the people that are lured away are lured away by the companies that they were actually investigating. So we need to do something about the lack of a revolving door. And I want to know, first of all, have you made any policy changes in an attempt to de deter this revolving door practice? We have um, instituted requirements that employees, um, senior employees, seek ethics counseling before they uh, leave the agency. And we um, require all employees to um, have a post-employment briefing so that they don't violate ethics rules when they are leaving. And, of course, we are subject to the government-wide restrictions, and we have some, some unique to the SEC restrictions. Um, but our Inspector General, in looking at a specific revolving door incident, has given us uh, last week some additional recommendations um, for tightening up our rules, and we are going to look at those very seriously, okay. and I hope to go forward with them. What about a cooling-off period? Why not require that persons within the Commission that have um, the, the authority to make determinations and who are in investigating are not allowed to um, be hired by those who they have investigated for a period of two years? Yeah, I, I, um, I think there is a lot of appeal to that. And I, the only hesitation I have is that we are so dependent on getting people to come to us, even if it is just for a few years, to bring us current industry expertise, that I have, we have to get the balance okay, right. But out. I don't disagree. Time out, because that is precisely the problem. The gentlelady's time has expired. Uh, I recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Chairman Shapiro, um, I, I want to get this out of the way. I know there have been a number of questions about uh, the David Becker conflict of interest question. So I just have a couple questions here. They are just yes or no. Um, and just I want to proceed with it because I have got some other issues I, I do want to touch on um, beyond this. Um, after David Becker told you that he received proceeds of a closed Madoff account, did you suggest that he recuse himself from the Madoff case, yes or no? I am sorry. The, the premise isn't exactly right. Uh, my recollection is that he told me that um, his mother had had a Madoff account um, before she died and that it had been closed. I don't honestly recall whether he told me he had received proceeds or not. He may well have. I, I just can't recall. Okay. And as you know, I haven't been able to look at any 
But he brought this up that he received proceeds from a Madoff account. Well, he, he brought up that his mother had had a Madoff account. I'm, okay. I, 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 In I light of that, did you suggest he recuse himself? No, I didn't. I expect okay. Did you suggest that he settle with the, with the trustee as other Madoff investors were doing at the time? No. Okay. Did you suggest that Mr. Becker disclose his interest to other SEC staff or commissioners who relied on his, his, uh, his advice? I did not. I expected him to go to the ethics office and get ethics counsel and follow their advice. Okay. And you are aware that the ethics counsel at the SEC reported to the chief counsel, the, the counsel, general counsel? Yes, although the ethics officer is a career employee. But, but his, his yes, direct yes. report? Yes. Okay. Um, did you suggest that Becker do any research to determine the amount or the character of interest that no. he had? Okay. Um, later, when Becker w was uh, providing advice about the net equity valuation method, did you direct Mr. Becker to take any actions with respect to this potential conflict of interest? No, because it didn't occur to me that this long ago closed account would be in any way impacted. Okay. It just didn't occur okay. to me. So he didn't disclose to you that he was, in fact, the trustee who closed the account? I, I don't recall. Okay, okay. Um, and I, I understand. I mean, I, I, uh, I, but I'm just trying to get to the heart of this. This, this raises major questions. And I think, uh, you know, I think you can understand the public's interest and investors' interest in it. Um, and, and so to that same uh, uh, degree, when Mr. Becker was filing briefs in court that took recommendations uh, in terms of the net equity position val valuation method, you didn't direct Mr. Becker to recuse himself? No. Okay. Okay. Well, I just want to get those out of the way. I, you know, obviously, we care deeply about transparency and disclosure, um, uh, both here in Congress and with, with regulators. And uh, Chairman Shapiro, M Mr. Uh, Reisinger, um, thank you for your public service. I want to thank you. I am not here to, um, uh, but we just need to get to the heart of, of this issue, and I think that's why we are asking these questions today, and that is why I am. I agree, Mr. And, Chairman, and it is why I have asked the Inspector General to do a review so we can get all the information yeah. and have a you know, But the point is, you said you wish you had known now what, you know, wish you had known then what you know now, and it, had you asked any of these questions then, you would have known it then. That's at the heart of the, this issue, and that's what's disappointing, um, and, and really uh, uh, of great concern in terms of public policy. Uh, Ms. Chapman, uh, in dealing with uh, this Madoff valuation question, I understand the insurance piece. I, I, I do. Would it have changed your dealings with the SEC's legal counsel had you known that Mr. Becker? Uh, was the trustee of a Madoff account? Well, if I had known that, I would have myself demanded that he recuse himself and that the SEC take steps to uh, clarify its position, because, as I say, uh, both Congressman Garrett and I believe that the SEC has taken an illegal position in supporting CIPIC. And if I had known that Mr. Becker had a personal interest, I certainly would have asked Thank you. Ms. Shapiro to do something about it. Thank you. Mr. Katz, this raises a bigger, larger management issue. We are talking about capital formation. We are trying to be the world's markets, which we have been. And when you have a, a dysfunctional agency like this with these management problems that you describe, you said um, the SEC is, uh, is never engaged in serious self-examination of its performance or used appropriate measures of performance. Is that still the case? Well, not having seen this Boston Consulting Group report that is apparently due out, I think that is, yes, that is the case. It has been a long time since the agency sort of took a hard look at itself in the mirror. Thank you. Uh, my time has expired. And with that, I recognize Ms. Maloney for five minutes. And uh, votes have been called on the floor. We have 11 minutes remaining in the votes. And so I would defer to my uh, colleagues on that side of the aisle if they want to work something out in terms of time, because we will have to... Uh, okay, because at the very least we get two minutes in for you, uh, Ms. Norton. Okay. Okay. Oh, sure. Yeah, your gentlelady is recognized now for five. First of all, I'd like to to welcome all the panelists and thank the chairman for this important hearing. And certainly, uh, honesty and uh, transparency is very important in in government. And 
I would like to really get further clarification from Chairwoman uh, Shapiro. As I understand it, in the controversy around uh, Mr. Becker's alleged conflict of interest is about an SEC decision that appears to be against his financial interest. Um, and as I understand it, prior to Mr. Becker's return to the SEC, he was working at a private law firm. Is that, is that correct? Uh, yes, he was. Okay. Now, when he arrived at the SEC, uh, you testified that he took steps to, to notify both you and the SEC's Ethics Council of his inheritance from his mother, uh, which had been liquidated long uh, before Madoff's Ponzi scheme had been discovered. Is that correct? That is my understanding. Yeah. And, and the ethics official said it was okay for him to work uh, on Madoff-related issues. Uh, that is what is in the memo and information that I read, that the Ethics Committee is there to be consulted. He consulted them, and they said there was no conflict. That is fine. Go to work. Is that correct? Your, your recollection, recollection? Yes, I believe your, so. Your memory is the same as the Ethics Committee. Well, well Chairwoman uh, Shapiro, it appears that the basic question the SEC faced was whether to support an asset valuation method used by the Madoff trustee called the cash-in, cash-out method, or a different evaluation method used by several law firms called the last statement method. Is that correct? Yes. And under the first method, Mr. Becker's inheritance would be subject to clawback litigation. And under the second method, uh, his inheritance would not have been subject to clawback. And the SEC chose to support the first. The decision uh, was against the financial interests of Mr. Becker. And this meant that the trustee could sue Mr. Becker and his brothers to recover some of his mother's inheritance, which, which is exactly what happened, correct? That, that's right. The SEC did take a position um, that was cash in, cash out in constant dollars to reflect that some very elderly people who had long held Madoff accounts um, would be able to get some more uh, money from SIPC under that formulation. Um, but it was not the final statement approach um, that, that you mentioned that, um, he, that would have per potentially pre prevented the clawback. But, but, he, but the decision was to allow the clawback. So I, I assume he had participated in a decision allowing the clawback that was against his financial interest. That is um, the decision to uh, clawback is one of the trustees, not, a, not of the SECs. The SEC did not make that decision? The trustee made that decision? The trustee makes that decision. The trustee makes that decision. But it was a decision that uh, affected Mr. Becker, correct? And I would like uh, either you or Mr. Mr. Uh, Crimmins to answer. And, uh, Basically, Mr. Becker or the SEC sided with the Madoff trustee. The SEC actually took action that was potentially detrimental to Mr. Becker's financial interest, and it exposed him to a potential litigation worth roughly $1.5 million, because that was the proceeds or the uh, correct, uh, in addition to the $500,000. So, so, so everybody seems to be criticizing Mr. Becker. But Mr. Becker and the SEC's decision appears to have been uh, completely against his financial interests. Now, I understand you have got an IG report coming out there, and, and that eventually will clarify things more. But in first reading the, the information, it appears that, that the decision made was against him and against his financial interest and, and what he thought or what the SEC thought was the right way to go. Uh, now, and, and if the SEC had supported the, the, uh, the bank's interpretation or the law firm's interpretation instead of, Mr. Instead of the trustee's interpretation, uh, Mr. Becker might not have had any exposure at all. Is that correct? Mr. Crimmins? I yeah, yes. Uh, uh, the, uh, the point is that the 500000 that Dorothy Becker invested was going to come back the 1.5 million, as you've indicated, that was the Madoff fictitious profits 
was going to be Picard's claim as the trustee, independent, reporting to the court, not to the SEC. The, del the delta, the little bit of difference is whether there should be some modest rate of return, whether there should be some adjustment for inflation. That is still not finally determined. A month after Becker has left the agency, it is a small amount. Yeah. And to an individual who was compensated at $3 million a year, roughly, and gave that up to go work in the public service, it is totally inconsequential. And it should not, I would respectfully submit to the subcommittees, be a distraction. General Lady. Sub but may, may, I, may I just complete with one observation for two seconds? So basically, if someone in Mr. Becker's position wanted to help himself financially, he would have taken the opposite point of view than the one that he took or General the one that the SEC expired. took. Well, the time has expired. We have votes on the floor, Madam. I and look so forward to I the was, IG's report. I think we all do. I appreciate the gentlelady um, uh, wrapping up. Uh, we do have votes on the floor. I want to thank the panel. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I am so sorry. Could I just, I, I wanted to just say one thing. I want to make it very clear. I don't recall specifically whether Mr. Becker told me he had inheritance from the account or whether he just had ha his mother had had an account, and I made that assumption. I just because it's two years ago, I just don't recall, and I, I just want to be so clear about that. That, um, and we'll let the record reflect that. Thank you, uh, and I, certainly, um, and I think it is important that the record accurately reflect what happened, and so. The findings of this hearing, it is very important. We were certainly interested in management issues. The members certainly uh, took a specific direction today dealing with this conflict of interest uh, of Mr. Becker, the, the general counsel for the SEC, uh, because of the, uh, the fact he was a trustee of a Madoff account a few years before. And the decision, as Ms. Uh, Chapman uh, mentions uh, that that was a very different valuation that was in existence under that then was in existence under law, um, and the decision that he made that that uh, in some ways benefited him uh, disproportionately um, than the other two methods. Uh, in terms of the 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 budget, uh, I think it is appropriate that the SEC have a sufficient budget. And we have strong management practices to make sure there is transparency and disclosure, safety and soundness investing in our markets. Uh, but in the wake of the Enron uh, uh, scandal, in February 2003, the SEC was given the largest spending increase in its history. Uh, the GAO says in testimony before this subcommittee in 2003, it was a 45 percent increase at that time. Uh, so uh, this, is, this was supposed to prevent a future crisis, yet Madoff still occurred. Uh, and the excuses uh, can all, not always be based on money. And we would ask that we tighten up management practices, uh, do what is appropriate in terms of bringing the technology to the fore, and do the best possible uh, of any regulator. And so uh, it isn't wrong to use a crisis to uh, request more. It, it, it is wrong to use a crisis just to request more money. And so with that, uh, this committee stands adjourned. And thank you for your testimony.